Thank you very much for the opportunity to give this talk, and I'm sorry I can't be there, but flying across the ocean for a two-hour talk, as, as much fun as an industry association meeting would be, it seemed a bit excessive. As many of you know, I've been uh, coming to New Zealand since 1989, working with uh, the seafood industry in its various guises on the science process. And uh, what I want to talk about today is largely uh, a project I did uh, to help produce a, a worldview on the status of fisheries. But first I want to begin by just giving you a little bit of, of history about uh, the perception of the nature of fisheries and their impact on marine ecosystems. And concern about the impacts of fishing goes back uh, to the very beginnings of the 19th century. And if I might just read one quote, this is from Garstang, published in 1900. It says, we have, so far as I can see, to face the established fact that the bottom fisheries are not only exhaustible, but in a rapid and continuous process of exhaustion. That the rate of which sea fishes multiply and grow, even in favorable seasons, is exceeded by the rate of capture. So if we were to turn that into to, uh, you know, 2005 jargon, it would sound a lot like uh, things we've been hearing for the last 15 or 20 years. The science of understanding the impacts of fishing developed all through the beginning of the 1900s. And by 1950, uh, what we would call the modern uh, science of fisheries management had pretty well been developed and ended up uh, sort of codified in a series of books, uh, really built around the concept of sustainable yield and maximum sustainable yield and the biomass that produces maximum sustainable yield. In the 1970s and 1980s, uh, these concepts were written into law, particularly uh, the International Law of the Sea, which really solidified uh, the, the, uh, the concept of sustainable fishing and trying to manage fisheries around the level that produces maximum sustained yield. But the world's always been a little more complicated than that. So for instance, uh, John Gulland, who was sort of the, uh, the best known fisheries scientist of his era, once sent me a quote, which was a definition of maximum sustainable yield. That is, it's a quantity that's been shown by biologists not to exist and by economists to be, to be misleading if it did exist. In short, it is the key to modern fisheries management. Um, and this theory really was in place by the 1960s when we had countries extending jurisdiction out to 200 miles. All of a sudden, uh, countries really started to think about managing their fisheries. And Initial fisheries management was essentially reactionary. You would wait until there was a problem, until uh, yields were declining dramatically and fishermen were complaining, and then something might be done. Most fisheries in that era were open access. There was no limitations. Anyone who wanted to go fishing in a country could just go out and buy a license for $100 and begin. Countries started becoming proactive, started introducing license limitation. Uh, the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, Australia and New Zealand were among the world leaders in this kind of fisheries management. And almost all countries, uh, or, or mo developed countries, were introducing something like modern fisheries management systems. And then in the 1990s, a long series of papers of concern about the status of fisheries began to emerge, and these, these papers uh, had enormous public impact. Uh, the ones I'm going to mention pretty well all got coverage in American major newspapers like the New York Times, and several of them uh, actually got front page coverage. The first one was actually a paper that I was one of the co-authors in 1993, uh, authored by, by Don Ludwig, was a lead author, and we basically argued that, that fisheries inevitably ended up overexploited because we waited too long to begin management measures. In 1998, a very influential paper, perhaps the most influential paper in fisheries that's ever appeared, came out, published by Daniel Pauly and several authors on the concept of fishing down marine food chains. And the basic idea of that paper was that uh, fisheries begin by catching the big valuable fish and over time fish down the food chain. Ultimately, we're going to end up with nothing left in marine ecosystems uh, but jellyfish. Then uh, an another very uh, high profile important paper came out in 2003 by Ram Myers and Boris Worm that looked at the Japanese
Japanese long line data uh, catch rates and basically argued that all the large fish of the ocean, so this mostly means tuna and billfish, uh, had been depleted by 1980 to only 10% uh, of their original biomass. Um, and again, that paper, I remember when that paper came out, front page of the New York Times. Uh, very, very big play. Now, this string of papers uh, has had a very significant impact on public journalists and even most scientists' perceptions about the state of fisheries. And, uh, and almost every paper about fisheries begins with almost an obligate uh, rec recitation of this, uh, this litany of disaster. And if I might just read one, this came out in uh, 2005. It was published in the journal Nature. Um, and this just repeats what I would call the common accepted beliefs. Fishing in the oceans is no longer sustainable. Worldwide, we have failed to manage the ocean fisheries. In a few decades, there may be no fisheries left to manage. So what should be done? Incessant hunting with increasing technological proficiency has decimated fish populations worldwide. Catches of large marine species, such as swordfish and tuna, have declined by 80% over the last 20 years. Uh, incidentally, that's wrong. They've actually increased 10 times over the last 20 years, but it's a good story. Um, northern cod, historically a dietary mainstay and a species once thought to be inexhaustible, is all but commercially extinct in the western North Atlantic in many areas, bottom trawls have scoured the seabed clean. These are just a few examples of the long and miserable record of hunting in the oceans.